All right, well, hello everyone and welcome to our School of Nursing virtual discussion. Uh, we're very excited to be here to talk about telehealth and telemedicine today. Uh, now it's more important than ever as we're amid a global health crisis. Um, I'm gonna begin by introducing myself. My name is Grace Strauss and I'm the Assistant Director of Communications and Alumni Engagement here at the School of Nursing. I'm very excited to be able to connect with you all here today. Um, before we jump into our discussion today, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. Uh, if you haven't already, please take this opportunity to mute yourself and stay muted unless you're speaking so we can avoid any audio issues. Uh, we also know a lot of people would like to receive these updates but aren't able to join us. So please note that we are recording this conversation, uh, which will be uh, saved or shared with all of you at a later date. Uh, for our agenda today, I'm going to begin by asking our panelists some questions and then we're going to open it up to a Q&A. So if you have any questions that you think up, uh, feel free to put them in the chat. And if for any reason we don't get to them, we'll make sure that we get back to you in the next few days. All right, well now I'm going to briefly introduce each of our panelists. If you can just give a wave when I say your name so we know where you are. Uh, we're happy to be joined today by Pamela Paplaham, who is Assistant Dean of our MS and DNP programs, along with Linda Payne Hughes, UB School of Nursing alumna and clinical assistant professor, Amanda Adams, alumna and adjunct professor, and Jim Lichtenthal, sorry, I butchered your last name, um, video conferencing and classroom technology specialist. So before we jump into our panel questions, Dr. Pamplaham is going to read a brief history of telehealth from a book chapter she co-authored, along with Tammy Austin-Ketch and Dr. Mallory Andrzej. The book, titled DMP Professional, Translating Value from Classroom to Practice, is currently in press. Uh, Pam, you could take it away. Sure, thank you, Grace. Um, I thought providing you was a kind of last minute idea to provide you all with some, um, some historical perspectives and how remote monitoring technologies have evolved and kind of to lay a foundation for our discussion today. So I apologize for reading this because as you know, most of you are academics and we would frown upon a student reading their notes, but I'm, I'm going to read directly from, my, from, from an, excerpt, an excerpt from my chapter. Uh, historically, the foundations of distance communication, which is essentially what telehealth is, was necessitated mainly by the demand for military logistics and preparedness for battle by increasing knowledge regarding where the proximity of the enemy was. H ancient distant medical communication was used by Greeks, Romans, and American Indians, mainly consisting of smoke signals and light reflection that not only conveyed births and deaths, but also notifying people of health catastrophes such as where the plague houses were located. With the invention of the telegraph, the rapidity of which medical person excuse me, military personnel could transmit valuable information about casualties, deaths, supplies, and medicinal consultation was significantly enriched. The telegraph led the armed forces to embrace this distance technology. However, the utility of that mechanism for the general population was meager due to the lack of a network for telegraph receivers and a specialty skill set required to operate this form of technology. In 1875, the, or, the origination of the telephone laid the foundation for distance communication as we know it today. Unlike telegraph technology, telephones became widely available to the general population, especially those living in metropolitan areas, and did not require a highly specialized skill set for effective use. It was this type of communication media that The Lancet, a medical journal published in 1879, that this type of technology would diminish unnecessary health appointments and increase informational exchange. The first EKG was transmitted over the telephone in the early 1900s by Dr. William N. Hoffen. This idea was ingenious, but it was not until 1924 when Radio News Magazine portrayed radio doctors by using the technology of a microphone and television to engage in distant communication, including the use of a heartbeat and te temperature indicators. Since most Americans had only started to embrace in-home radios at that time and te television technology was in its infancy, this was considered a highly futuristic vision. As a visionary, Dr. Hugo Gernsback in 1925 predicted that radio and TV would be used for patient-physician communication. Dr. Gernsback would also pioneer the, area, the, the idea where radio signals were used to generate a patient video image and operate a robotic hand remotely to perform a physical exam. 
This foresight is now thought to be the ancestor of robotic surgery. By 1948, the first radiographic images were sent via telephone across a 24 mile stretch in Pennsylvania. By 1959, Nebraska established a closed circuit television link between a hospital and psychiatric center in need of consultative services. And Nebraska also pioneered the first real-time video telemedicine consultation with interactive neurologic examinations. In the 1960s, the US space program began testing transmission of data to scientists on Earth for medical monitoring systems attached to animals on test flights. And this later then would be in later in that decade would be used for manned space exploration. Further evolving the issue of distance communication um, is in the years following was the development of the internet and social media use. This is not part of my book chapter, but those of you that have published realize that the information is dating as the, as the book is getting published. So this was written pre-pandemic. And um, it's without a doubt that the COVID pandemic has rapidly projected the implementation and further evolution of this healthcare delivery platform. And I think U UB School of Nursing has been very um, ahead of the game. Uh, we, by uh, having this in our curriculum even before pandemic, recognizing that we needed to sustain this portion of our curriculum again, pre-pandemic, and then the pandemic was upon us. So we are actually, ahead of the game and have now have uh, multiple faculty and graduates that have come through um, that have a baseline knowledge for this technology. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Papalum. That was a great way to kick off our conversation. Uh, now I'm going to kind of jump into our panelists' questions. And to begin, can I ask each of you to briefly explain your experience in telehealth, what you I'll have done with it so that our audience knows uh, what your expertise is in. You can go in any order too. All right, I'll speak since I, I can, I'll continue to speak and anybody that knows me knows I like to talk. Um, so I was part of the initial HRSA training grant um, in the UB School of Nursing. Um, and as in my current role as the assistant dean, I was responsible to make sure that this um, technology continued to exist beyond the HRSA grant. Um, and my current teaching role at, in the School of Nursing really has focused on the DNP projects. And to date, I have had seven students complete DNP projects that focus on telehealth. Um, additionally, with the pandemic, my, my personal um, professional practice uh, moved to telehealth. And so since June of last year, my clinic is solely telehealth now. I'm Linda Payne Hughes and I'm clinical faculty and I inherited the HRSA grant as a project director, program director. And so that um, had increased exposure to the students and to the telehealth components of our programs. So um, actually Amanda was one of my students. I worked closely with Jim in um, various ways to purchase equipment for the school, um, handhelds, handheld devices, wearables. As, as the equipment um, develops, we've expanded. So we have a nice base for our labs and for our students. And I also have own a um, private urgent care via telehealth business. And so I'm implementing it in clinical practice as well. I'm Ann Coya. Click on this. I'm Ann Coya, and I was a nurse practitioner at Niagara Hospice in Lockport, New York. And with the COVID pandemic, uh, Medicare required part of the recertification process that we do by an NP or a hospice physician do um, a face-to-face -face visit. And when they started, when the pandemic started in March, um, the nurses, the hospice nurses were able to do telephone, you know, assessments. But CMS said that uh, in order to complete this requirement, you had to do a face-to-face -face via telehealth. So um, we used Zoom. I also used Google Duo, 
um, to do the face-to-face -face requirements. Um, and I would also use the nurses, like if they went to visit a patient's home. Medicare said you had to see the patient's face. You know, I couldn't just call up the patient or the caregiver and say, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. um, so that's how I really used telehealth. I didn't, um, I didn't use telehealth to prescribe anything or anything like that. So I'm Amanda Adams and I am a student or was a student, sorry. <laughs> Still in the student mindset, I guess. So, you know, I, I learned under the HRSA grant and under both Dr. Papleham and um, Dr. Linda Payne Hughes. So I was actually out at the test coordination and utilized telehealth there, which, you know, I, I'm now the, one of the full-time nurse practitioner at the reservation. So, you know, the, the te we talk all the time about how tel the telehealth that we use through UB really kind of set that foundation with the reservation and with um, that Native American population, that telehealth was something familiar and useful um, and something they felt really safe with in terms of getting their care provided through that platform. So when the pandemic hit, it was, it was a very easy transition and actually something that most people kind of embraced and don't want to give give up at all you know they're very happy to do a lot of their visit um over the phone or with like a facetime situation because that's i mean they have a lot of difficulty accessing care even when it's a mile and a half down the road you know people would walk to our clinic walk three miles to the clinic just to get um, a pain medication refill you know because you have to do things in a certain way um, to fit a clinical guideline and, you know, some of this stuff you have to see patients regularly and, you know, it'll never replace that face-to-face -face visit, but mm -hmm. the patients wholeheartedly embl embraced it, um, uh, because we had already had it pre-primed through UB and then, you know, with limited access and not being able to come in and see somebody because of their own reservations with the pandemic, I think it just made this, it was just an absolutely wonderful transition and it's something that I think will stick. And I personally use um, Doximity, it's an app. So I've been able to utilize that platform rather than just calling people on the phone or having the availability to call people from my home, which was nice having a baby and you know following up on weekends with things. Um, where you know it, it, it's given us the availability to talk to people without giving our personal cell phones away so, I mean, that has rapidly expanded over the last six to eight months just because of the pandemic. So it's very been, it's very interesting longitudinally how these things are evolving and just like technology evolving so rapidly. Mm -hmm. And I'll wrap things up. I'm Jim Lichtenthal. I've been working in distance education and video conferencing for about 17 years. Uh, so to the point where when we started, we were mailing VHS cassette tapes of recorded classes to students and video conferencing was you needed to hardwire from point A to point B and that's the only way that it could work. Needless to say, since we're all on a Zoom call now, technology has progressed rather rapidly um, so that really just about anyone can video conference now. As far as the grant and the telehealth at the School of Nursing is concerned, to me, this is all related to what I've been doing in distance learning. Uh, we're just adding a you know nursing component to it but it's the interaction that's needed, right? The uh, presence by being able to see someone, talk with them. And then you can add all the other components of uh, some of the peripheral devices that, you know, could take temperature and you could see a real-time readout and things like that. So that's my background and where we are as of today. Awesome. Thank you all so much. Uh, so can some of you walk us through the techniques that you use in telehealth and let us know if you have any personal recommendations? So I guess probably makes sense if we just go round robin again here. So, um, so the technique that I use in telehealth, it's um, when, when the hospital that I work for moved to this platform um, for patients during the pandemic, um, they really really underscored going through the patient portal um, for compliance with HIPAA, et cetera. Um, however, many patients um, just like to use their phone, um, which, you know, is fine. Um, 
And it's a spectrum between, I don't have any of the bells and whistles we had at UB where we could actually, you know, listen to the heart and, and through the telehealth. Um, and, and I have to tell you as a nurse practitioner, um, and many of you are nurse practitioners that are on the call, um, it has stressed uh, or it has really pushed my skills to assess to the, to the max. It's, it's, you would think it'd be an easier way to do a visit, but it's not. You've really got to use everything you have and generate the history as, you know, 90% of your diagnosis can be from a history. But when you don't have that other 10% putting your hand on the patient, that's a problem. And what, you know, of course, I prefer to visually see the person, but you do have some, um, when we talk about barriers, um, you have some very technology adverse people as well as people that don't have access to technology. So you have to use whatever resources you have. And sometimes it, it is just the telephone. And in my opinion, again, using that skill set, the hardest thing is when, when I was face to face at the hospital, I walked into a clinic room, you knew when somebody was toxic, you could just tell by looking at them that that person may need further care or even to be admitted. But now with just a telephone call, you're really having to um, use everything you have skill-wise as a nurse and a nurse practitioner to make sure you're making the right determination about that patient. So, and I don't know if you have anything else to add to that with your hospice experience. Well, you know, you're, you're right. You know, I mean, when I would go into the patient's home and do the face-to-face -face visit, you know, I would listen to their heart, listen to their lungs, kind of do a brief assessment. But when you're using, you know, somebody, you know, like a person's cell phone, you know, you basically just get the face. Maybe they might show you their feet if there's something to do with swelling. But it's really just kind of looking at the person, talking to the caregiver or whoever you're talking with to say, well, what's been going on with this patient over the last two months? To help us recertify you. Mm -hmm. But I, I did go into the homes and do face-to-face -face visits during COVID. Um, and we did have sufficient PPE. Um, but most of the time it was just gloves and an N95 and social distancing. Mm -hmm. I'd like to speak to the, um, our, our courses, our DNP courses, where we've, um, we're integrating um, telehealth education. Um, I work with Jim a lot and we will, every class that the student goes through, we are exposing them to a certain aspect of telehealth, whether it's in assessment or in um, more the family nurse practitioner program or the psych NP program. So we, we might be doing a phone consult or doing a pilot um, consultation we do have um, dental partners that we have through the grant and we have dental cameras. So that our students have practiced using a dental camera. So some technology, which are the handheld devices and then connecting with the dentist to give a report. So they have practiced um, working with other interprofessional um, practices. And we've done site visits with the equipment, um, patient visits, and the consultations. Um, it's really, we're expanding their knowledge and their comfort with it. And through that, we're also expanding our their preceptors and their practice um, knowledge and comfort with telehealth. We do have um, a lot of supplies that we purchase through the grants that are called wearables, um, things that'll take blood pressures. We have 24 hour um, pulse, um, pulse ox monitors. We have a little um, Cardia mobile, which you can do a six lead EKG on in the home, or you could send it home with a patient. So if they start to get palpitations, they can put it on and it records. So we're really expanding the use of technology um, in an affordable way. So our students are comfortable, our preceptors and our faculty. And then in my private practice, it's mainly telehealth. So I have a platform which is HIPAA compliant and um, the patient schedules their own visit through the platform and we meet and then I have electronic record um, that I would fax over script or um, lab tests. So two separate uses.
So at the reservation, while when I'm physically there, we use our HIPAA compliant um, EMR to see patients. And, you know, we would schedule people sort of similarly in the sense of like a regular in-person visit versus a telehealth visit. It's a little bit different there because we don't bill the same way that an outside private practice or even a practice in a hospital bills because of the way, you know, it's funded federally. So it's, it's slightly different in terms of how we have to structure things. Um, so oftentimes I just use something as simple as the telephone and I call patients, but the one tool like Dr. Paplingham, you know, talked about is that I rely most heavily on my ability to take a really good history. And, you know, that's something that, I mean, I don't, I think I was in the program for several years and that's one thing that is, you know, really driven home is how to take that great history and really how to rely on, I don't want to say like not my physical clinical skills, because of course those are so important, but there's so much you can gain from that history. So, you know, learning how to take a good history and just li like listening to your patient, you know, I know I'm getting to know a lot of these, the patients I care for quite well. So I can tell when they sound more short of breath or congested, or, you know, you can pick up on those little things even over the phone. Um, so that's something that I'm learning how to fine tune myself. And, you know, if somebody's got good internet coverage, like maybe they, I can FaceTime them um, and actually physically see things. But a lot of people, and I think this was spurred a little bit by the pandemic too, um, is now they're really engaged in their healthcare. There's a lot of buying, you know, blood pressure cuffs and O2 monitors off of Amazon, which, you know, sure, they might not know really what to do with it. But from a provider standpoint, it was useful for me to say, okay, well, you, you got that. So put it on your finger. Okay, tell me what the numbers say. And, you know, d does that feel if I explain it to you, does that feel like reality to you? And, you know, so there's a lot of a lot of educating distantly that we did, as well as sort of assessing distantly. And I, I mean, I, I felt like it worked really well. And it was, it's definitely a contrast to what I used as a student where I was physically there, but the preceptor wasn't physically there. So it, it's sort of a, a shift, but I, I mean, I feel like it, it, it's worked very well for us. That's great. Thank you all so much. So our next question would be, in your experiences, what are the biggest apprehensions that the patients and even providers have when it comes to telehealth? And to that note, what have you all done as experts to help them overcome those apprehensions? Well, to sum it up in one word, technology, 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 in my opinion, from both patient and provider, it, it's scary using a new type of care delivery platform. Um, and so, you know, patients, I, I don't push them. If they don't want to use the virtual platform, I, I will talk to them on the phone. They're actually asked up front when the, the clinic secretary calls to confirm their appointment in advance with me, whether or not they will be okay with a virtual visit, because certainly if they're not, that's, that's fine. They're brought in for a face-to-face -face visit. It was done as a, uh, it, it was done to decrease foot traffic within the hospital during the pandemic especially working in the clinic that I do where people are severely immunocompromised, you want to decrease the social density as much as possible. And the patients that I see are survivorship patients. So a lot of them are back to work. So they, they're getting exposed in their, in their personal and professional lives and then bringing whatever they may have been exposed to into the clinic. So, you know, I think um, it, it, most people have been very accepting of it. The the older group of patients seem to be the most risk averse for the technology, but I just talk on the phone and they're absolutely fine with the phone call for the most part. Um, they do miss the the face-to-face so, -face interaction, but it's really in my short-term history of using this, it's not because I'm not giving them a service that they, they have accepted. In fact, I I checked before this to see if administration or the patient advocate had had any complaints about this type of platform. They've had none. But um, I think, you know, I think it's important um, that we continue to, um, you know, embrace the technology, but actually educate our patients and know which patient populations are going to be the best to carry this forward with when the pandemic is starting to calm down and, and hopefully ending eventually that my population, I would love to continue this, but I'm then leaving them without the socialization aspect of healthcare with when you have a chronically ill population like a cancer survivor or 
or like Amanda that's on an Indian reservation where it's so important to get to know your patients or, you know, Anne doing her hospice and everything. There, that's a big portion of care is that socialization aspect. They want to see the people that took care of them and sometimes cured them or, or so that that's a hard that's going to be a hard struggle down the road, I think. But the technology clearly is a problem. Oh, Linda, you're muted. Thanks, Pam. Yeah, I agree with you what you've said. I think confidential confidentiality is a big concern. And I think maybe we see it more as healthcare providers making sure that they're comfortable with this technology. Um, technological failures seem to be a big problem. So in my practice, um, if they have an outdated um, platform or um, um, Google Chrome or their, their browser is outdated or cluttered with um, um, downloads, they won't be able to log on to meet with me. And to try and talk them through that, it leads to my, how I perceive it is they would question whether this is a safe way to um, receive care because they're not my ongoing patients. It's an urgent care setting. So um, that is a concern, but I always wanna, if I don't know the patient or I'm just getting to know them, it helps me to watch them so I would prefer, if we have technology issues, prefer a FaceTime mm. or, and, then, and then talk to them. So I kind of just watch their body language and I can see if they're confused on an issue and we can talk about it. So those have been some um, problems I've experienced. One thing that I've done, we would get logged onto the platform, which is called MEND, and we could see each other. I could hear them. They couldn't hear me. So we put a call into IT um, at the platform, and if they didn't answer, somehow we solved it. We got on the phone, talked, but we could see each other, and that led to a better relationship and understanding as we move through the process. So you always have to do workarounds. So Jim's taught me that. You always have to figure out a way to make it work, but you really want that patient to feel comfortable in that they're getting the best care. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think technology is both our biggest blessing and almost curse um, because there are a lot of pitfalls. And it's certainly something I even remember as a student working with Jim and um, Dr. Austin Ketch, because she would often be the preceptor I worked with at the reservation. You know, many times I could see her, but I couldn't hear her. Or she could see me, but couldn't see us. So, you know, we would often do something as simple as, you know, Linda said that we would just call each other. And that worked, you know, it was a fine and easy, straightforward workaround. Um, and right now, you know, for patients, we do give them the option to choose a virtual visit or to do an in-person visit. And I'd say probably about 90% of the time, patients will prefer um, a virtual visit. Like, of course, right? You know, I don't have to commute there. I don't have to do this. I don't have to do that. Come in, be exposed, what have you. Um, but you know, we've recently been running um, vaccine clinics for the COVID vaccine on the reservation. And it was this sort of interesting, you know, I didn't realize how much I missed it and how much I think the patients actually missed coming in and seeing each other. You know, I, it's funny, we kept joking that it feels kind of like Christmas um, or New Year for them where they go like from house to house and greet each other and see each other. It's a, you know, it's a really, community is very important. And it's something they haven't been able to do. So we've been giving these vaccines and they have to wait for 15 minutes. And then the 15 minute waiting period, I, I would watch them for any side effects and enter some data. And so as I was doing that, you know, I, I'm watching everybody just, I, I mean, it feels like a big party, even though a socially distanced party, you know, for people in a room at a time, but still, you know, just seeing them see each other. I, I think that is one of the biggest challenges and drawbacks to telehealth is that they don't get to see, we don't get that socialization. Um, and that's also very important for us too as providers because it does build that support and rapport. And I'm, I'm grateful that I was at the reservation as a student as well as for a few months prior to the pandemic hitting because I was able to see people face to face. And now they come in and they immediately want to see pictures of the baby and you know they want to visit. And then, okay, so I saw them in person, then maybe three months from now, 
will be their next in-person visit and we'll just do virtual visits in between. So there's, that's kind of how we worked around some of that too. And interestingly enough, nobody really, and maybe that's just because they trust um, the clinic that we have going. They're not really concerned about HIPAA or privacy because I, I feel like they know that, you know, we're doing things. Um, they've seen us, how, how we do stuff. And, you know, that really wasn't a big concern, I guess, um, which I thought was fascinating in the population. Yeah. So I just wanted to touch on the technology part that everyone's been mentioning. Uh, working in technology right now, it's the wild west out there. There are dozens of companies that offer all kinds of flavors, right? Some of them work, some of them don't work so well. What we need to have is FaceTime. We need it to be as simple as FaceTime, just connect, plug in any peripheral that you need. It just works. We need Steve Jobs of telehealth <laughs> to figure all this stuff out. And it's not that complicated. It's just companies are trying to do too much all at one time. So I may work in IT, but I'm not really an IT guy. Uh, it's got to be simple. I'm not going to use it if it's not simple for me. And I work in this stuff. I get frustrated when I can't get things to work, right? So I can only imagine people that don't use it every single day, how frustrating and discouraging. And yeah, it's going to call into question, boy, do I really even want to do this? Do I trust that this is going to provide me the care that I really need? It'll get there. It'll probably take five years for it to weed itself out when companies really figure out what they're doing and get down to very, very simplistic. It will be video conferencing, calling Zoom. Zoom is so much better than anything was 10 years ago for the desktop. And it won't even take that long now because we're all used to using video conferencing. We need FaceTime. That's what we need. Right, right. I agree, Jim. And um, Jim and I were at a conference and um, telehealth conference, what, two, two years ago now in the summer. And um, we sat and visited with Dr. Ellis from ECMC, who is their telehealth guru over there. And we were kind of looking for different technology. We had these big cases with all sorts, like Pam mentioned, um, you know, stethoscope, EKG, all these um, peripherals. And then we'd have trouble connecting and we couldn't use anything. Dr. Ellis said, no, just go small, keep it simple, keep it so you can communicate. And I think that's really where we're headed now is the skills we need to understand the hands-on, how to use it, what it's about, and really hone in on our interview skills, our assessment skills with our eyes and our ears. And so things are evolving, but Jim's right. I think just keep it simple. Um, use your, your FaceTime and go from there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Wonderful. Thank you all. It looks like we have a hand raised from Lana. Lana, do you want to unmute and uh, share or ask your question? Yeah, I did want to ask a question because it brings back when I worked in um, primary care as a nurse practitioner, I had a whole slew of support people behind me. Um, you know, the secretaries, the schedulers, the RNs on the phones, the LPNs, you know, doing the pre -os. I mean, uh, you know, the uh, techs um, you know, running around the halls. Do you have less support staff with telehealth? And how, how do you manage <laughs> without it? Well, and briefly for me, Lana, um, I did have support staff from nursing. I, I obviously have secretary support for appointments and confirmations and everything. But for nursing support, um, about two months ago, um, they with the COVID testing and now with the immunizations, they really had to reallocate the nursing resources. And so they basically said, what can people do without needing an RN to support them? And so I stepped up and said, I'll run my clinic by myself. And it's kind of been an eye-opening experience. And I, I'm hopeful that down the road it will go back. But it actually has given me, again, some, some reinforcement of my foundational knowledge that is, you know, um, not there when I was face-to-face, -face, meaning that in a true clinic setting, the nurses would intake the patient. You know, you have an aide check their vital signs. The nurse puts them in a room and goes over their medication to reconcile it. That's a piece that I'm now doing. And I don't want to give that up now because I think you, you're not really completely processing it by just looking at your med rec. By actually doing it with the patient, you're really getting like, oh, okay, so your, your dose got changed by your cardiologist or you know, things that they sometimes disclose to the nurse practitioner or physician, but don't disclose to the nurse either. So I think that um, 
Yes, I have less resources now, but it's actually been an enhancement to me as a nurse practitioner. And though eventually I would like to have nursing support again, there are things now that I will keep just to better my assessment and my plan for my patient. Thank you. All right, well, if no one had any other questions, I'll jump on to the next question. Um, and this came up a couple of times in audience questions, but can you all speak to the legal regulations to consider with telehealth? I know that's a hot topic. Um, so I went in and again, when my institution was launching this platform because of the pandemic, um, I, I just wanted to give you a couple bullets that they said, and, and some of it is legally related, but um, for each visit that I do, there is a attestation statement that has to be put into the note. And basically some of the elements are, in, including I already mentioned that they really want us to go through the patient portal. Um, to, so, to make sure it's as HIPAA compliant as possible. Um, I have to document how much time I am spending with the patient. Um, and, and if it's audio only or audio visual, because there is a difference with the billing, which Anne already mentioned, and sometimes billing is declined depending on what their insurance mechanism is. Um, we have to have associated electronic medical record doc documentation along with anything we're doing in the telehealth, um, which I never went away from. So that wasn't an issue for me. The patient, when the secretary calls them, actually has to consent to have their visit via telehealth. You can't just say, well, sorry, you're not going to be seen. And if they don't want it, they have to be able to be seen as a face-to-face -face patient. So um, um, they, the, the patient has to understand it's a billable visit. So just because it's not face-to-face, -face, the patient needs to know that they will be billed for it, you know, and um, that I think one of the biggest legal issues is be aware of your surroundings as a provider, that you're not sitting someplace where behind you is a patient walking by, where other people can hear the, you know, when you go into an exam room, you close the door. So you really have to, sometimes with the virtual, you could be in a, a work room in a clinic and other things are being said about other patients. Data can be in the background, whether it's your, and I do mine out of my house. And I realized the other day that the bullet, I moved, my children were home from college for a few weeks and I moved into my husband's office um, because all the other bedrooms were being occupied by children. And um, I realized that the bulletin board behind me had a lot of personal information like my lab work when it was due, et cetera. So I actually physically had to take everything down from the bulletin board to make sure there was nothing behind that I didn't want divulged about myself. So I think, you know, that that's one of the biggest concerns. And I know when Amanda was in the telehealth program uh, at UB um, and, and when Dr. Payne Hughes took it over, um, one of the things that we really were uh, needing to be cautious about is when telehealth was active with faculty doing the visits, we had to make sure that if somebody opened the door, despite a sign being on the door that telehealth was actively in process, that the person standing in the door, we could not see the patient. So we had to make sure the desks were set up so that that screen was not visible from the doorway. So the, those were the, those are the things that come most to my mind. So I could add that um, we work in New York State and we have federal regulations. So CMS guidelines for billing will, will dictate whether you can see a patient via telehealth, which we've talked about. And then they also regulate the provider of where they can be. So if you're in New York State with CMS, you're going to bill CMS. You need to be under the state regulations, patient in New York State, and you are in New York State conducting your telehealth visit. New York State has regulations also to that effect. So, and they can be changing. So you really need to be aware of what your state and your federal guidelines are. But um, I stick with, you know, only in New York State would I see a patient just to stay within those regulations. Even though I don't bill CMS, it's still a, a safety thing to, this is where I'm licensed, this is where I'm gonna practice. And we do the we do the same thing, you know, covering down the line. I, I know I mentioned earlier that we're a little different because we don't bill the same way, 
um, because it is a reservation and, you know, it's, it's completely different. Um, but one thing that, you know, Niagara Falls Memorial that the clinic is sort of partnered with, um, something, cause we do use our EM, you know, we share the EMR, um, was making sure that we do have an attestation in there and something I'm pretty vigilant about every single time that, you know, I see a patient virtually. And, you know, it's funny when we would just do like, like if somebody called cause they have a cough, you know, and you would just do a quick telephone encounter um, as opposed to seeing them physically in the clinic for whatever reason, you know, maybe they're out of town or what have you. Um, you know, I would never, I don't think I ever once thought about saying the patient verbally consented to having this visit occur over the phone. Um, so I feel like that was, had been a little shift and something that was definitely positive. Um, and, you know, another thing that was sort of, we were seeing consistently, and maybe it's just because it was a newer thing, um, even specialists, you know, they would conduct a lot of the visits over the phone. And when it would come to the physical exam, it would just be blank. And, you know, something that we started doing was just saying that the physical exam was deferred, you know, at this time and giving a reason, um, you know, because of the pandemic or because of patient condition or what have you. Um, so those are two things that I, we really tried to include so that it was very consistent and, and I think what is legally, you know, what, what needs to happen. Um, so that if anything were to come back where the patient said, well, I didn't want that. Well, at least you had that backup saying, well, yes, you did verbally consent to this. Um, so that's very important. And then quickly, just one thing I would add is secure connection. The connection needs to, you need to make sure it's secure, encrypted information. Um, encrypted really cannot be broken. If it's encrypted the right way, there's really no way to break that. Um, you need to make sure that those companies that claim that things are encrypted, it's got to be the right kind of encryption. That's a legal thing that I think we're going to find play out somewhere down the road. Someone's going to claim something and it won't be true. So we'll get some more clarification on that later. And, and um, Jim and Linda um, are currently using um, iPads for our students, not in the foundational nurse practitioner courses, because we believe those should be face-to-face -face visits. Um, but in the latter portion of the program, for any of you that are master's prepared NPs that graduated, the DNP is now a thousand clinical hours. So um, the, the, the latter portion of the program, uh, when they're in their DNP uh, projects, we are um, uh, having them sign out an iPad for the two semesters that they're in um, their project to use for their site visits. Certainly if the preceptor calls that there's a problem, we, we go and do the, the visit face-to-face, -face, or if there's a concern our, on our end that the student may, may not be where they should be knowledge-wise, um, we would go face-to-face -face as well. But I think one thing, and Linda you can, and Jim, you can correct me if I'm wrong, we, they have to use the iPad assigned to them from the School of Nursing for, because it has been put through our IT department. So they, we just don't tell them, have an iPad available for your site visit. It's gotta be the School of Nursing one. Correct, and then we, give them a Zoom link. So that is all um, HIPAA compliant as well for their site visit. Wonderful, thank you all. Another common question that we received was about prescriptions. So what are the recommendations for prescribing medications during a telehealth visit? I mean, I go through the electronic medical record and e-script. So it, it really hasn't changed that for me at all. Um, I won't prescribe narcotics in my clinic because it's a survivorship clinic and they should be linked with a primary or uh, if they're having, you know, in a supportive care type of clinic if they need it. So um, with me seeing them so infrequently, they know up front, I will not prescribe pain medications, but other routine prescriptions, I just e-script them. So that really hasn't been a, a departure for me than anything I've been doing in the past. Right, so that hasn't changed because we have to, through our electronic um, health records, so I, I use Practice Fusion, that has a built-in component, and that's how we don't handwrite scripts anymore. So that really hasn't changed much. Same thing with controlled substances. That would be a little out of the ordinary, but you still can do that, mm -hmm. um, you, you know, if that's in your comfort zone. But our assessments and our plans and our um, prescribing really hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that think this kind of maybe dovetails maybe onto a question Grace was getting to, but um, but I think um, 
that is one of the barriers to telehealth is that, you know, when I was face to face with the patient, if you needed lab work or a diagnostic, you just sent them for it. They, and they, if you had a, a, a practice site that had those um, services available, and now there's no choice, you're on a telehealth visit. So you've got to generate those orders. And then going back to Lana and what she said, that's where I'm feeling it too from the RN standpoint, because an RN from their scope of practice can't interpret a test result. That's for me as a nurse practitioner, but they can certainly call the patient after I've interpreted it and give them instructions what to do. And with me doing that all on my own, but so that that's, that's I think a barrier um, in that, you know, um, you don't have that point of care service for the additional things that may help you make a diagnosis. Great, thank you so much. Um, I know we're down to our last 10, 15 minutes. So before I move on with the questions that I have, I wanted to open it up. If anyone here on the call wanted to ask any questions, um, you can feel free to unmute yourself or if you prefer to put it in the chat, I can ask on your behalf. Oh, I have, a, I have another question. Sure. <laughs> uh, remembering my primary care days, uh, the forms. It seems like everyone came in with a different form. How, how do you deal with the forms if someone doesn't have like ability to scan them to you? Uh, um, so, go ahead, Amanda. No, I was just going to say, you know, that is something that was challenging. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for from uh, on the reservation, we do a lot of referrals, American Indian health referrals. Um, so in order even to send somebody for lab work, if they don't have outside insurance outside of the Tuscarora coverage, um, they have to have this like piece of paper stamped and, you know, with their information filled out in order to get labs done. So that was kind of something, you know, a, a big hurdle to overcome when we're not bringing people in or when I was working from home, you know, saying, okay, well, I'm ordering these labs. And if nobody's in the office, like, how do I do that? So, you know, I mean, I relied heavily on apps, um, you know, healthcare specific apps where I could, you know, take a picture, like scan a PDF um, and upload it to our system that way. So, you know, there, there, were, there were definitely some workarounds. And oftentimes what I would end up doing is faxing it to my clinic because I knew it was secure, like faxing it through my phone to my clinic downloading it from the EMR into the system and then sending that to, you know, Summit or wherever they wanted to go for the lab work. So it was multi-stepped, but, you know, and it was something I'm sure that there's a thousand and one ways that it could be way more streamlined, um, but that's how we would you know, accomplish that. And the same thing with um, forms. So I would say, okay, can you fax it to the clinic? And then I would be able to access it, download it um, into their, from their EMR, um, so it was all secure. And then I could kind of repeat the process back, which is a little bit different if I'm physically in the clinic, um, to like doing telehealth visits. But when I was at home, that was definitely something that, you know, I was, I relied heavily on. I agree, Amanda. So part of my practice is um, certifying for medical marijuana. And um, there are forms that I have to review from their primary. So the fax machine is going, then I have to get them their certificate. So I snail mail, I mean, I'll screenshot it via their phone. They have it on their phone, but I, they need the hard copy. So it's just, you got to do what you have to do to make it work. And it, it's all good because that's the world we live in. And it's so much easier in some ways because they're staying at home. I'm staying at home. I'm not exposed. They're not exposed. It's all good. Okay. Thank you. Would anyone else like to ask a question? Grace, I just want to add something and maybe it'll sure. spur a conversation on um, too, that one of the real benefits that I never really thought about before I started to do my practice with telehealth was that I get a glimpse of the patient's home environment. You just don't realize sometimes the chaos or other issues that are in people's homes that you have an aha moment about why maybe something they needed to do medically wasn't completed in the timeline you asked them or completed at all. And once you get a glimpse at their home arrangements, sometimes it's like, whoa, 
now I've got to really rethink how I can how I can do this plan given what those limitations may be. So I think that's been a huge, huge benefit of not having that person right sitting in front of me is getting a glimpse at the home environment. And for the psych NP students who are doing um, telehealth with their preceptors, same idea. They're really getting an understanding of what's going on, what their social determinants are. It's, it gives us a whole nother um, area to assess and um, take into consideration. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, just yesterday, I was somebody had called for a granddaughter that needed something. And when I had called back to speak to the um, caregiver, I mean, it sounded like they were running a, a small daycare. And I mean, it was just, it was so overwhelming to me to hear all of the chaos in the background and to hear, you know, how overwhelmed they were. And, and you know, it would have, it would have been easy for me just to say, we'll take her to urgent care or, you know, to, to kind of refer out for things that really wasn't something, you know, given the situation, something that I not, I don't want to say I should have done, but you know, I, it would have been easier for me to refer out rather than actually treating. Right. Um, but I just, you know, hearing the social situation, I, you know, I was taken aback by how difficult it would have been for that person to go to urgent care, you know, and you, you do have to weigh really, you know, clinically what's best for this patient versus, you know, what's possible. And I mean, I, the caregiver said, well, what am I, how am I supposed to get 10 kids to urgent care? And I was like, you know what, you're absolutely. <laughs> so, and I knew that if I said go to urgent care, then that child, the child would not have gotten care at all. You know, so there's, you know, that definitely gives you, it, it gives you a little bit more access to them and them to you. And it also gives you that background, like I, and if they had just come into the clinic, I probably wouldn't have known that, you know, that they were actually, that there were 10 other kids at home. And, and that was one, because of the community setting and two, because of the pandemic, because there's been a lot of spread out there. So um, a lot of families are, are moving their kids to places that they know they can get care while the parent quarantines. Um, so as to not spread the virus to their kids. So, you know, I, I mean, I wouldn't have known that. And it's not something I would have even thought to ask. Mm -hmm. that, that, and, and I agree that sometimes it, co it comes down to, you wouldn't have thought to ask about yeah. that. As a, as a brief example for me, I was, you know, again, I work with cancer survivors and I did a virtual visit with a patient who beat the odds and was able to have children after her cancer treatment. And um, she, her, her youngest was between one and two years old but she was still breastfeeding. Now that is not a question I would have asked about a child that, you know, was greater than one years old because most people stop breastfeeding, you know, at that point. But because she was still breastfeeding, she had the baby on her, uh, or the toddler on her breast when, that, when the call first started. And it made me realize that I had to rethink what immunization she could get that were safe to give to a breastfeeding mother. So it it really added a safety line to my plan that I hadn't thought of before. And now that is in my mind, even if I go back face to face, if I have patients, which again is a very small minority, but have young children, I'm going to ask, are you still breastfeeding before I write down those immunizations that they're supposed to get? Because I just wouldn't have asked that. Absolutely. I 100% agree with that. It, it definitely changes, um, or not changes, but more augments and brings out things that maybe I hadn't thought of in a while. Or, you know, you're busy and there's so many other things that you're focusing on to provide really great care. Um, and, you know, sometimes it is as simple as that, you know, that you see it, you happen to see it and you're like, oh man, I would have never thought, you know. Hi, uh, my name is Barb Nunn. I'm in Arizona, COVID capital of the world. Um, <laughs> I work with the Apache Reservation and I'm not going to put on my video because I haven't combed my hair since April and I've got on my new pajamas or yoga pants, which I change every day. But my job in doing telehealth is we, because one out of every five people who are screened and as was mentioned, maybe some people don't have water to wash the light shampoo out of their hair. Um, and families are multi-generational, three, four generations living in a house that has two bedrooms. So 
I just wanted to share the hope that I feel for telehealth because one of the things that I found, at least in my native population, is telephones are very, very reasonable. And um, the tribe has taken a, a very hard issue. Uh, Arizona is is pretty conservative in that masses aren't mandatory as of a few days ago. And you can bring your gun with you wherever you wanna go. And um, so the spread is rampant. Um, I myself had it. I am a seasoned person of 75 years old, been an NP for a longer time than I remember. But the good thing is that I have to slow down and listen because I can't look at a lot of uh, body language per se. Uh, I, ca I can see clothing to a certain extent, but most of my visits are audio. And so I have to listen to tonality. My stethoscope is my ears and sustaining conversations. Um, one of the consequences we're finding with COVID uh, antibodies is that might have COVID antibodies, but then a lot of people are still coming in and they have pneumonia and then they die. Um, have a lot of that on the res because of diabetes and extreme morbid obesity of 500 pounds and 10 day old babies. And um, so, but, but the hope that I want to share is that this is such a great tool for people who have phones that I can call them and say, hey, you've been out of, again, they're in a casino hotel. You've been out of quarantine now. Tell me what's going on because COVID doesn't leave you after 14 days. And uh, for, for the NP, I see your, your beautiful picture on my screen and I like the tat on your forearm. Um, <laughs> There's so many tribes that we have out here in Arizona, and there's also discrimination. Um, I was the white doctor for a couple of years, but I just thank everybody for sharing and taking a healthcare to a new avenue and allowing um, individuals the opportunity access to healthcare that as you said, when you gotta wait for somebody to come and pick you up for three hours and they don't show up because maybe the car broke down uh, or maybe they're hungover or maybe they forgot you. Um, you know, you can't be really quick to cancel that appointment because you're 10 minutes late. You might be two weeks late. And I have to be considerate, my people are all locked in a casino and once those doors open to the rooms and shut, they can't go back in. Um, that's all I have to say is that I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk with other telehealth people. Um, I work 24 hour days when I'm on, I work 40 some hours a week, uh, a little more than that when the phone rings in the middle of the night a lot, but um, it's just a great tool for the management of COVID. And um, maybe I'll comb my hair, maybe not. I'll keep, my, I'll keep the video off. And by the way, I graduated from UB a very long time ago. And um, thank you all for being there. Great to hear from you, Barbara, that was wonderful. Um, I just wanna add something for anyone who may consider or wants to learn more about telehealth, um, the HRSA grant that we had has supported a resource center in each area. Our area is the Northeast Telehealth Resource Center, and you can find that online through or go to HRSA. It's N-E-T-R-C. It has anything. And if you have a question, you can put it into them. You also could reach out to us, but you could put it into them. They're very good with responding. So if you're thinking of starting to do telehealth, anything like that, looking at regulations or different ideas, they're amazing and it's free. I just wanted to add, I'm also a Suboxone dispenser. Um, in the pandemic, along with alcoholism, uh, naltrexone is excellent. 
um, to hook up with, uh, I get phone calls from Western New York. I live in New York City and have a house in Western New York, but I'm in Arizona now for four years. And, but it's a tool that is wonderful for things um, like Suboxone dispensing, so. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for sharing. Um, it looks like we're just after one o'clock and as much as we could probably talk about this forever, I want to keep you to your uh, promised one hour. Um, so I just want to give a huge thank you to everyone who joined us today, especially our panelists, and anyone who spoke to uh, share their stories with telehealth. It was so interesting to hear everyone's different perspectives. Um, as a reminder, I'm going to be following up with an email later today uh, with the recording and some other information of stuff going on at the School of Nursing. Um, if you did have any unanswered questions, please feel free to shoot me an email. You can reach out at grace, G-E-R, at buffalo.edu, or you can just respond to the email going out later, and that'll get to me as well. Um, and that's it. I hope you all have a wonderful weekend, and if you're watching the game, go Bills! Go Bills! <laughs> Thanks, Grace. Of course, thanks.